Hello, it's me again. And what I'm going to talk about now is what I call tower power. And I also wanted to go back and um, explain a couple things, a couple aspects and concepts that I've been uh, discussing with previous tutorials. I, I kind of made the assumption that you knew how to go through some of the algorithms and I thought it might be useful to kind of go through how to deal with the different tower cubes and to just sort of review that. And in so doing, we're just, we're going to look at a variety of different types of tower cubes and um, some of them we might actually even go through a little bit of a solve. So let's define exactly what I mean by that. Now with tower cubes, I divide it into two subspecies, two types. Let's move this to the side here. One type, um, there's my little family collection there. One type is the kind that has a, a symmetry that is, you, there's like a radial symmetry where you have like a three by three by x or a two by two by something where, where basically the length is longer than or larger than the width. So it looks like a tower. So here's an example, a three by three by four, three by three by one, two, three, four, five, three by three by five, three by three by six. So these are obvious examples of towers. The other example of a tower is what I'll call the brick cubes. Brick cubes are something that um, doesn't necessarily have that kind of a uh, radial symmetry. These are like the one by two by three, three by four by five. Um, and because bricks and towers, since bricks are made of, since towers are made of bricks, maybe there's a little fractile concept here where the behavior of one is just like the behavior of the whole. Um, here's an example classically of one of my favorite bricks. See, it looks like a brick. This is the three by four by five cube. So it doesn't display the radial symmetry. Here's an example of another one, the two by three by four, poorly stickered by me. And uh, other examples would be those that do have a radial symmetry. Here's a four by four by three. But what makes this more of a brick than a tower is the fact that the length is shorter than the width. So I'll call it a brick if it does not have radial symmetry or the length is shorter than the, uh, than the width. So these are all examples of what I would call bricks of the tower one by um, three by uh, three by three by one, three by three by two, and this one over here, one by two by three. And of course these, and also this one here, I guess too, the two by two by one. And these are all examples of towers, but they're solved very similarly. Here's a four by four by five that I've talked about in the past. So we'll go over a couple of ground rules in terms of how to solve these things. So in addition to dividing it between bricks and also between, um, between towers is another type of symmetry which is odd to even or even to even or odd to odd symmetry. What that means is here's an example of a three by three by uh, four. If on two of your sides you have either both odds or both evens, then you can actually make 90 degree turns at every axis. If you don't, then you can't. So what I mean by that is here, along this radial symmetric axis, I can make 90 degree turns, no problem. Over here, however, when I'm mixing an odd number with an even number, I can make a 90 degree turn, but I can't go anywhere with that. I can't further scramble it, because you can see it bumps against it, and I can't solve it back that way either. So I have to just do 180 degree turns if I'm going to continue to scramble that. So that's if I'm mixing an odd with an even. But that's, so here's another example of that. Two and three doesn't really mix, and you can see it bumps into it, uh, bumps into each other. An example here, this is a one and a two. I move it here, and you can see that it prevents it from turning. But take a look at something that's a two by four. If it's a two by four, they're both evens. If they're both evens, I can make a 90 degree turn. I don't bump into that, so I can make another 90 degree turn here. So that gives me the characteristics of shape shifting. And that's gonna occur when I have a situation where I have two evens or even two odds even two odds, I hope that made sense. Um, that could be best demonstrated if I had like a three by three by seven or a three by three by, you know, nine. Um, you know, if, if you have other odds. Here's an example of what I mean. This is a, a three by four by five. So here's the, uh, here's a three side and here's a one, two, three, four, five side. So if I move this down to 90 degrees, 
I can actually, because they're both odds, it can shape shift pretty easily. But on the same cube, if I do it in the four axis and move it down to the one, two, three, four, five, it doesn't shape shift. So that's, that's an aspect of, of what we mean. Now if this were fully functional, you can see it's a one by three, so it should be able to shape shift. And you can see when I turn it down, there should be nothing to limit this from turning. The only thing that's limiting this is of course the way this is constructed, but there's other floppy cubes that can actually be constructed to where they can shape shift. Same thing with this guy too. One and three, I move it down. This should be able to shape shift over here. So those are the general rules of thumb, and it makes the actual process of solving it potentially challenging, <clears throat> but the strategies are really um, exactly the same. Might as well start off with some of the simplest examples that uh, don't have any length to them. Like here's, here's an example of something that is all corners but no edges, the 2x2x1. Two by two by um, here, here's a one that has both edges and corners. The importance of understanding these is you're going to run into cubes that have these embedded into it, that you have to define a middle. Sometimes when you're solving the cube, you have to find where the middle is, solve for that, and then, and then uh, go for the rest. So starting off over here, if you have an odd number, then you have to define, an even number rather, then you have to define where your center is. Uh, the other thing I should mention is that if you have a shape shifter, well, if you, if you have one that's not a shape shifter, it's really just a matter of solving it using 180 degree turns. So in many ways, it's very straightforward. If you have a shape shifter, then you have 90 degree turns, and the trick is first, get it back to the cuboid form. Second, use your 180 degree turn strategies that we're going to talk about to solve the cube, and that's all you really need to know with that. The other thing to bear in mind, too, as you're doing, doing your solving strategies, is that if you have an odd number as you're solving it, you, have, you, you don't have a center that you're defining, so you actually have to define a center. It's not there for you. That's as opposed to, that's as opposed to say, this guy, the 3x3x5, three, the three by three by because this is odd and this is odd, I can do a 90 degree turn and I can shape shift. But because this is odd here, I'm going to have a center that's defined, which means if I scramble it into a full shape-shifting scramble, I could potentially get it back into the cuboid form and end up in a trap and not be able to solve it that way. So I have to bear in mind, i got to get my centers in place, and I'll have examples of that. So to get our centers in place, let's look first for an example of something where there's only corners and no edges. Now this is pretty simple. You can scramble it in various ways. Now you're going to hear when people do tutorials, they're going to talk about solving things, quote, intuitively. So what do we mean by, by saying that we're solving something intuitively? What that means is that the degrees of freedom and the degrees of, of um, variability that can happen are so small that if you just keep moving things around, like this is a scramble, my kids love to play with this because it increases their confidence. If you just keep moving things around, even if you don't have a plan of attack, eventually you're going to just accidentally stumble into the solution. Intuitively means you're just kind of guiding things, but even just by browning in motion, you're eventually going to run into the solution. This is corners. We'll take the most simplest version here of a brick, I guess, and this one has edges. So we're going to go ahead and uh, just do like a scramble here, make it look real complicated, real convoluted, and just arbitrarily and randomly. So when dealing with this, you're going to find certain cubes where you're going to have to solve for the middle. Now what I did is I simply scrambled this using 180 degree turns. If this were fully functional, then I could turn it like this and I can turn this around and I've actually got, or turn this as well. I do have something coming that's going to allow me to do that. But bear in mind, once I get it back to the cube form, I have to make sure that I did it right. Otherwise, it's going to be impossible to solve just using 180s. I have to take it out of that cuboid form, out of the cuboid form. So if it's like this, then we talk about intuitively solving it. Well, the, uh, the general strategy is going to be first, let's get my quote cross or get my middles. So this is the orange side, this is the yellow side. This is going to be the general strategy with all the rest that we're going to use. So I'm just going to start from the beginning. So here's red. Um, right next to red is going to be what? 
So for the time being, so right to the right of red is gonna be white. To the right of red is gonna be white. So turn that back here. So I'm gonna want my white center, uh, I'm sorry, edge. So white here, right next to white is gonna be what? So here's the orange here. To the right of white is gonna be blue. So I know that the blue center is gonna be here. Here's the blue center here. Turn that down like so, which just leaves the green. So that gives me my cross. And that's gonna be important as I start to build layers. Now notice with all middle layers, I'm not gonna be able to borrow from parts above and parts below. This is all self-contained here, so I just have to make sure that I'm getting it right. Now the rest I can call it, quote, intuitive. I'm not gonna talk about general strategies, I'll leave you to work that out, but by intuitive it means if I just keep moving things, here's white, I wanna move that over here, but it's, it's, you know, it's the wrong, it's gonna be the wrong color if I do that, so maybe if I go like this instead, this and this, turn it where it needs to be, and this. All right, now this turned out to be easy. It was, quote, intuitive, which means even if that didn't work, then I can just start moving things around. I don't need to get into algorithms. And that's really what we mean by that. Not a lot of degrees of freedom with that. So that's a basic um, introduction to how we would have to deal with something like that. Moving it up to something that's a little bit more complicated with the one by two by three. Again, this should be fully functional. And as we scramble this, So too, this just kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about. That once we get it back to a cuboid form, it really isn't much, it really isn't that much of a challenge. Um, we can define this is green here, this is blue here, yellow and white. So now I just put these edges in intuitively. Put that here. You can see we have a little bit of a parity situation. We'll talk about how we're gonna deal with that. So you can just sort of play with it a little bit, quote, do it intuitively. And it gets it back. So that's just by way of introduction, how we define the towers versus the bricks and the rules of engagement in terms of odds and evens.